one last time uh, now. So more, more and I met uh, for the first time a few months ago in Rotterdam for one of the events we organised. That's where I found out the white ball, but it was also my idea, um, which I'll obviously have the great pleasure to, to let you explain. So Morton's really going to have a conversation with you about having been growth hacking uh, for the last couple of months. Uh, two years. Uh, months. And lessons he, he also learned from investing money and things that you know, customers didn't want, but also how we ended up not investing anything uh, from what people wanted as well, which turned out to be working. So really actionable tips about growth hacking, triggers, how to set up experiments or how to not set up experiments. Uh, I think it's just a very timely because a number of you are at this stage of the of, of the of the other of the adventures of entrepreneurs. So I hope you find the uh, Morton story really compelling. Uh, thanks so much again for being with us this morning. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Alright guys, can everyone hear me? In the back, you can all hear me? Alright, great. Uh, well, thank you all for having me here. Um, I always like, like the end of the people uh, in Rotterdam at events, and uh, so now I'm happy to stand in front of you. Uh, before I get started on the fireside chat, I'd like to get to know you guys who who's in front of me as well. Also, it, it will let me know uh, how deep I should go into topics, basically. So, who we are is a uh, who here is a first time founder. Raise your hand, just by show of hands. Who's a first time founder? All right, oh, less than I expected. <laughs> so, uh, who here had an exit before? Congrats. Oh, Congrats. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, ho hopefully, if we have this group together in a few years, hopefully, we see some more hands there. All right there. Now, before I uh, go into my company, uh, let me tell you a little background story about myself and how I got into growth hacking, basically, because uh, that's a story by itself as well. This is me before I started the company. I was a professional poker player for eight years. Uh, I only played online poker. And the thing about online poker is uh, you have to be really good with data if you want to play multiple tables. Um, so this is where I, this was my first introduction that of my skill set that I love data and I love to find spots where people are not performing as they should be. So in poker, you have two concepts. Uh, one is called GTO. This is a uh, game theory optimal, which is also uh, that concept is also used in different games. Uh, game theory optimal in poker means uh, you calculate most of the situations to perfect, and you, you try to play as close to the math as you can. If you do this, if your other opponent makes mistakes in the long run, you will win. Now the other concept is exploitable, meaning if if your opponent is very far off the math, you can make more money by by uh, making up tricks or plays uh, that crushes their league, basically. And this is very similar to growth hacking, where you find spots where people are not performing as they should, and then you double down on it to uh, take advantage of it. Now, to put in perspective how much of poker I played, um, I played about 5 million hands online. Now, if you're playing with your friends on an evening, playing cards uh, or in a casino, you average about 20 hands per hour. So do the math how much hours I spent <laughs> playing this uh, game that I love. How many screens were behind you? Um, uh, 12 tables on this one. Okay. Yeah, I see. I mean, how many more screens do you have? <laughs> uh, depending on the game. Like um, 2010 to 12, the games were much easier. Uh, people were not that GTO yet. Uh, so you could play a lot more tables uh, with data. Um, as the years progressed, people got much better at data. Um, so I had to play less tables to really find exploitable spots. Because if you are playing uh, uh, 20 tables at a time, your timer is so fast, uh, you have to make decisions within 30 seconds, and you can't go too deep in the data. So in the beginning, uh, the players were very bad just at the, at the basic level. So the basic stats were already so bad you could make money. Uh, if you have to deep, dive deeper into the stats, it takes more time, uh, and you have to play less tables uh, because of that. you have a question? Did you make enough money to pay that traffic fine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always have my fines in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps me motivated to win the pot. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I just made some notes to see if I didn't All skip right. anything. Alright, so while I was playing poker, I'm not, not on to a location. Uh, so what I did, uh, and my poker friends did, we just travel around the world and find spots to rent a house. And then we just play poker together. So that's when I also started AdAlert. Um, I was traveling the world um, in 2017. 
So here I'm on uh, Cook Islands uh, in a house I rented because it had good internet. And this was around the time of Cash Hard Fork. I don't know if any of you was into crypto, but it was a major event in 2017. And I just rented the house there for a week so I can <laughs> relax and focus on this uh, event. So that brings me to Aeropolder, my company. Um, I don't know if any one of you is familiar with AirDrops, so I'm gonna, just going to explain it very quickly. Um, in normal marketing, you have giveaways. Uh, people give you a free sample, and then they help. They create some brand awareness. They hope you come back later. Or in software, I don't know if any of you are building a platform with software. A lot of the times, they give free trials for an X amount of time, and they hope to convert later through sign up. Airdrops is the same in cryptocurrency, and they give you some free tokens up front, uh, and they hope to get you in later, basically. They just start experiment experimenting with the platform, uh, spread the word if you like the uh, the project, and that sort of stuff. So in by itself, Airdrops is a growth hack method already. So what we did is we built a platform where users can find Airdrops. This wasn't around in 2017, I was quite surprised. Um, I thought it was quite fun to collect free tokens, and I wondered why it was so difficult to find them. So we created a platform called Airdrop Alert, and to date, this is our user metrics uh, approximately. We still receive uh, 80K new use or users a month, around 60K of that is new, and the majority of that comes to Google. Um, two million users to date, 250K social followers, approximately the same email subscribers. And on our B2B page, uh, we get about a thousand unique visits per month, and also we spend zero on advertising till date. And we are gonna experiment with advertising a bit in the next couple of quarters. But up to now, all of these numbers are hit without uh, any money on advertising. I see you wanna ask a question or? No, no, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll talk about it. No, it's, it's great. I'm looking forward to, this, to the story. All right, all right, you're like nodding <laughs> All right, so what is growth hacking? I know it's a fun term. It's data-driven, funnel marketing based on experiments and testing. And especially the last part is very important. Uh, like Julian said, I did waste a lot of money building a feature on our platform. Uh, cost about 100K and eight months of my time. And now we have only like 30K of our users uh, are using it, which is not a big number if you look at a total uh, thing. And especially the time that went into that was, um, was long, stressful nights for building something that eventually the user didn't like that much. So especially testing is the most important thing there. So this comes to um, uh, what you want to accomplish with the testing part. It's a product market fit. You're gonna, every one of you has, has probably has a good idea and you think your user's gonna like that good idea. And when you are clicking on a platform, you might not like a button on a certain size or a function here. And you think, wait, if I make this different, then my user will enjoy this. That's not always the case. Like I said, with the dashboard, I thought users would really like it. They didn't like it that much in the end. So it's important to find the product market fit. And how do you do that? And uh, that's by A-B testing small things first, spend as less money as possible, and see if you can get the traction that you're expecting. Make good case and worst case assumptions up front and then see where you land once you run the test. Um, oh yeah. So uh, 10 years ago, uh, if you build an awesome product, uh, you would get users. There weren't that many good products, platforms out there. Users would come organically, and if you spend some money in marketing, it can go really fast. But today, that's not, not the case. There's many talented developers, People are getting better and better at making good products. A new generation is coming that, that grew up online. They know what people want and buttons and stuff. So growth hacking becomes an important part of releasing a product. Like you can build the best product in the world, but if you can't reach the people you want, uh, you won't get the adoption that you need. So what I want to say about growth hacking, it's not like it's a bag of tricks and here you go and it works on every platform. Growth hacking is a mindset. Like I, me and my team, we talk every week, what do we need to grow, how are we going to grow it, who's going to be responsible for this growth uh, metric. And we do this every week, and then every week we come back, did you hit your metric? No. Why didn't you hit it? Was it the, were the assumptions wrong, or didn't we execute properly? 
So this is the life of a growth hacker. <laughs> so we just keep running, running, running. We keep trying things, different things. Sometimes it works, you get the power up. And then at some point it doesn't work anymore and you have to start over. And this is really how it goes. You, you try, try, it works. Uh, growth hacks tend to have a short lifespan. So at some point, things are going great. Um, and then you, you, you focus somewhere else and you see it dropping. And that's okay. You just have to find new growth, growth hacks, see if you can like put some extra wood on the fire you created. Uh, if that doesn't work, move on to the next part. So if you look at this, this is all the things that are involved in growth hacking. I think we did about everything except the online hand. Um, and it's really about trial and error. Obviously, if you're looking at this, you think, I can never do this. Uh, you need a growth team to start working on this. But if you're a first-time founder or you have a startup, you have to pick where you think you will get the most traffic and start there and start trying right there. So one of the mistakes we made in the beginning was SEO. Uh, our MVP that we built wasn't SEO optimized. I thought it's okay, I'm gonna worry about that later. Um, but as it turned out, we got a lot of traffic and traction. And once we started getting traffic, we started getting a lot of clients. So we, the clients was where the money was coming from. So my focus is there. And then for about a year, we didn't do anything SEO wise. So in that year we saw com competitors coming up. Um, and after about six to nine months, we saw organic traffic drop because the competitors, they were SEO optimized and we weren't. Um, even though we we're having a lot of fun making money, uh, when I saw the organic numbers going down, I started worrying because if, if my competitors are gonna get all organic traffic, maybe they will get the clients in the future as well. So we had to play a, like a catch up game uh, for about a year where we spend a lot of focus on SEO just to make sure that we are number one on SEO on most things uh, most important keywords right now. But that was one of our mistakes. Um, I would not advise you to like spend a lot of time on SEO at the beginning, but if you make a website in WordPress, you can very easily get a basic SEO going, which doesn't have to doesn't have to take that much time. Yeah, go for it. Uh, background question on, on the airdrop. Is that some, so who, who is really your client? I don't fully understand it yet. Is right, it when there's like an ICO? Then they go to you to give out some. ICOs are one of our clients' uh, target groups. Yeah. So um, in crypto, everything is new. Everyone's in crypto as a startup, uh, and they all need to acquire users. And we are not at the point of mass adoption yet. We're far from it. We are still at the early beginnings in cryptocurrency. So the the point of all the coins and projects is to try to gather as much users as they can right now, because as because users tend to uh, be sticky. If they come to a project and they like your project, they stay there and they don't switch too fast. Um, so our ICOs are one of our clients, but also established coins um, like Stellar. I don't know if you know Stellar, it's a top 10 coin. It's doing a major error right now, giving away like 200 million in tokens. Um, and so IEOs and dApps are also uh, our clients. So dApps are decentralized apps and they also need users and giving away tokens to acquire them. So in the end, airdrops are a simple user requirement uh, marketing technique, and most of the cryptocurrency startups uh, are using them. So in two years, we listed about 2,500 airdrops. Um, and every year, I think in 2018, there were about 3,000 ICOs. So you can say the majority of the projects, they use airdrops. So I understand that you're already revenue generating. So how do you make money? Um, well, we're a startup, so at the beginning, um, let me see if I come to that. Uh, so, in the beginning, one of our biggest growth acts actually that we uh, developed was one of our best uh, revenue drivers last year. It's um, when we were the first platform for airdrops. We were still trying to educate the community, the users, about airdrops, and we're trying to educate the clients about airdrops where they should give away tokens. So, this, I'm going to come to that later also. This is how we brought value actually to the community. But in that we saw a few problems during that educating phase. Um, the projects didn't have that much success with airdrops because they were managing it very poorly. It was a, like a total chaos. People didn't know what to do. 
And then for the user, the experience wasn't that good because they come in a group and everyone's like, what do we do? Where do we go? And uh, all these questions. So we decided to make an airdrop service where we told the clients, hey, we are the, the experts here, even though we were just starting, but we're the experts and l let us take care of uh, everything and we'll make sure the whole campaign goes well. And by doing that, we immediately got the emails of the users as well. And we could start emailing them like, hey, have you seen this? Or follow us on Twitter as well if you like airdrops. And so this was actually the biggest growth hack we did in 2018 or late 2017. So we created a service that didn't exist, uh, which was valuable to the clients and it was valuable to the users. And since nobody um, had that service, uh, there was no benchmarking price. So I just uh, whipped out a five figure number. I said, we're gonna charge this. And once I got three times say yes, I just moved that price up until I got too many no's. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that's uh, how we made money in 2018. Right now we're doing more of an um, automated thing because that is very team extensive uh, to run a campaign like that. Uh, and since we did that and it worked, we see a lot of people doing it and also from countries where their uh, salaries are much cheaper. So we're trying to uh, have a more automated thing. So now we just charge for listings. Uh, it's very easy. The project's going to apply for a listing. They're done within five minutes. Um, and we're releasing a B2C model. Uh, and right now we are in the testing phase uh, of that as well. So what we're doing with the, now that I'm in the B2C thing uh, story, what we're doing with testing is again, it's something, we're releasing something completely new for the users. We're, we're releasing a subscription model that the users can receive adults in their wallet, but they don't have to claim them. Um, and why that is important right now, the projects uh, that are trying to growth hack their uh, ICOs, asking for a lot of things to claim the airdrops. So back in 2017, they asked, follow us on Twitter, you get an airdrop. But now they ask, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, upload us on Reddit, follow us on LinkedIn, like us on Instagram, complete KYC, and then six months from now, you get an airdrop. So we see the user retention is dropping. Um, because we, we figure out that users don't like the eight to 10 steps they have to complete instead of the two. So now we're giving a subscription model where users don't have to do anything. They're going to get adults in their wallets every month. And um, so now this, again, this is new. So how do you determine the price? Um, I think five euros a month is fair, but who knows? Maybe people are willing to pay 30. So what we did is we created three different landing pages. Every landing page has three different prices on it like three different packages. And we sent like uh, 500 people. We sent one email, one page, 500 with the other one, and 500 the last one. Different things at the same time, not on different days. Because if the Bitcoin price goes up one day, people might subscribe more. So you want to cut out as much variance or different factors as you can. So we target everyone at the same time. Uh, we put hot jars on the page on the pages to track what users are doing. And uh, we track who opens the email, who clicks through it. Uh, and, now, and then we can check uh, uh, conversions and are people spending less time on the pages than the most expensive one? Yes or no? And surprisingly, uh, on the most expensive page, we got the most sales, but it was the cheapest package on the page. And so that was surprising to us. I thought the most expensive page would get the least conversions for sure. And so now, second part of our test is we're going to test the most expensive one and the cheapest one to a bigger sample. Once we get the price point, right? Um, we're gonna test more, but then it's more on the layout on the page. Am I gonna change the colors? Am I gonna change the, the sales styles? Uh, what I uh, optimize there. But first, the price point is very important because on a subscription model, if you get a euro difference on, on like 10, 20K subscribers, there's a lot of money every month. Just spending time, taking time to test it, to find the right price point can be very profitable over the next two years for you guys. Let's see if I missed something on the previous page. So on that is, if you're testing, you don't want to spend too much time uh, creating something. So we always say, if you're not embarrassed by your MVP, you spend too much time developing it. <laughs> so this was our MVP. Actually, this is the second version. The first version didn't have all these fancy colors. Uh, <laughs> So it was really simple. It's just a list. Anyone that lands on a page that's looking for airdrops can understand what's going on. It's the upcoming airdrops, the active ones, and the past. And then if you click on it, it was a simple pop-up. It had not more than 50 words linking to where you have to go to claim the airdrops. So that was it. 
I didn't know that Google didn't track pop-ups. So all, all, that, uh, all that text was uh, like going away. That's why we didn't rank on SEO as well. Um, but yeah, it was uh, fairly simple. And the dashboard was really where we, uh, where we took too much time uh, later. Uh, once we got the competitors, uh, they had the time to build nicer sites. They had us as a benchmark. We're going to build something nicer. Uh, so we had to play catch up later, uh, like I said. Sure. So now we're going to building a community. Um, like I said, when we started, uh, nobody knew about airdrops. Even in the crypto world, it was very unknown. Uh, I've been in crypto since 2013. All my poker friends are in crypto since 2013. Everyone is like over invested, and so they spend a lot of time on it. Uh, but nobody knew about airdrops. And I missed a bunch of airdrops that were worth thousands of dollars uh, for me because they were based on how many bitcoins you have. So in the beginning, there was if you have one bitcoin, you get a thousand of these coins, which were worth a lot of money. So what, who, who will be interested in airdrops from my perspective? The end goal is always the regular, the average Joe, like people walking outside. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't my mom like an airdrop basically? It, it's free tokens. But it's not the right target audience when I want to start. Like it's very hard to convince an average Joe to, to collect an airdrop instead of someone in the crypto community already. So what we did is um, we look at where are the, more, the hardcore crypto fans. They were on the Bitcoin Talk forum. So then I so then me and co-founder were strategizing how are we going to convince these people to collect airdrops or go to our website. So both of us made like five accounts and we started posting on a lot of things. Not about airdrops, but we wanted to build the forum reputation. Because um, if I'm a newbie with zero posts and I'm, I, I'm posting, hey, you want to check out my site? It doesn't work. So you create a lot of accounts, start posting. Uh, not about airdrops, we're just posting on projects, asking questions like, what is this for? Why are you doing this? Or this looks really cool. Um, so we're trying to build a rep. Once we did, we started contacting the projects uh, that were starting. And then we said, did you consider doing an airdrop? And then drop the link, you can find them here. And that's the only thing we did uh, for the B2C side. <laughs> and then that, started, that ball started growing pretty quickly. Uh, and before we knew it, we had a thousands of uh, visitors on our website. And before we knew it, we had 500K visitors on our website. And that was all still on the MVP. So people still liked, uh, liked our website. Now, how do we convince the projects to do airdrop? That was another uh, hurdle we had to do. Because we had to educate uh, them on why they should give away tokens. So I started. Every ICO that was listed on ICO sites, I started trying to figure out uh, figure out the phone number and start start dialing. And I I, I just dialed like 20 times my goal. I, I'm gonna call 20 ICOs a day. I start dialing, dialing, dialing. If so they don't pick up, write it down for the next day. And I start dialing again. And anyone that didn't have a number, I just shoot an email. Like, hey, this this is a concept about airdrops. We can contact your community. Are you interested in hearing more? <coughs> Now, how do you explain airdrops to projects that say, I don't want to give away free tokens? So me and the co-founder, we started thinking of, we need to convince them with scientific terms. And then how do we do that? So co-founder is a psychologist, so we're saying like, all right, if, you, if you're a person that owns something, and uh, you overvalue it, and that's called the endowment effect. So we started throwing that into conversations like, yeah, but if, you, if people get your token, even though it's for free, they're going to overvalue it. And that's good for your price, uh, or the token price in the long run. And then we start saying, like, you need to plant seeds because there's a lot of uh, tokens out there. If they recognize your name because you got it in your wallet, uh, they might be more interested in buying it later. And we had, like, a couple of things that we are we just purely made up. We wrote it uh, on the website as well. And yesterday, I was on the Bitcoin Wiki, which is the Wikipedia of uh, cryptocurrencies. I uh, Google or looked up airdrops. Then I saw my things that I made up was in the, like, why would projects give away tokens? Was like, bullet points was exactly what I made up. Mm -hmm. So someone copied it. I didn't make that page. Someone copied up my website and put it on the Bitcoin Wikipedia. And still to this day, uh, we left about because we just made that things up in Thailand drinking beers. <laughs> <laughs> and people were like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> this works. So that's how we were actually bringing, we were bringing value for the users and then also for the project. Somehow it does make sense to the community. I mean, huh? Somehow it does make sense to the community. It does, it does. It does, yeah. 
Uh, also, one of the things we did for B2B is um, um, all the ICOs, they wanted to get listed on ICO Bank, which is the aggregator for ICO information. Now we saw pretty quickly that they created a page for agencies. And so we hustle our way to get listed as an agency as well for agro services. Uh, I had to do a few calls with them, explaining them why. And then suddenly we were top three agencies for ICOs. Now this, uh, with this, a lot, we got a lot of inbound questions. Uh, do we do agro services? And when I asked them, um, this is also a good trick, by the way. When you get inbounds, you ask them, where did you hear from us? Because that will teach you where you need to focus your energy on getting more inbounds. So on the ICO bench, I got a lot of people saying, oh, we saw you on ICO bench, you were rated very high. And that uh, turned on a light bulb and we started like contacting all the ICO sites to try to get listed on there. Uh, and once we got listed on several, we, we definitely saw the inbox coming in more and more and more. Um, so that's, it's called soft data. You want to ask them as well, uh, where did you hear about us? What we also did when on the calls, even though if the project did not uh, list their error on our site or did not use our services, we would still advise them. Because um, it was in our best interest if the user uh, would have good experience collecting the airdrops. Because um, I want the, this popularity to grow amongst the users or this concept to grow amongst the users. And I thought if all the ICOs that do an airdrop do it well, the users like them and start collecting more, and then they come to our site. Um, all I asked if they, if, if they took a lot of my time when I was advising them and if they didn't buy anything from us, all I asked, like, uh, put a link on your site, uh, like uh, AirDrop uh, advised by uh, AirDropAlert.com, um, just so we can, uh, uh, we have some value from the time we spend in. And this also, like, had a, had a sort of viral effect because ICOs, they look at each other. They look at what did this project do well, and then they find our link, or they find our name, and they find our name on a CEO bench and it created a sort of brand authority for us that we were the authority in the space and that what that's what you want to do it especially if it's in the new space you want to try to position yourself as the authority even though you aren't yet and uh, try to do it like i said when we had the mvp i just call them up and say we're the ad experts what do you want to know tell, tell me what do you want to know and we'll and we'll figure it out for you and um, so that's that's a uh, not everyone can do that uh, for sure it's more a thing you can do when it's a new niche. And if in an established niche, then it's much more difficult to accomplish. But if you are, try to figure out ways uh, how you can accomplish that. Yeah, so like I said, if you do A-B testing, you have to be like a mad scientist. You just try, 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 find something that works. Uh, growth hacks have short lifespans for sure. And you wanna keep trying and keep trying new things um, also, if you, like, not all growth hacks um, will work for every company. And a lot of times people see the trick eventually. Um, so I know Airbnb did a growth hack where they scraped uh, Craigslist Grex, for a while and then they were advertising just to get the users. And Craigslist, uh, like, got that lead properly now. <laughs> um, a lot of things with emails don't work anymore. Uh, so you have, to, you have to try and be new and don't be scared to try things. Like, I had one idea for satoshialert.com. Satoshi is the person who created Bitcoin or company who created Bitcoin. It's a, it's an alias, so nobody knows who he is, but he goes by the name Satoshi. So my idea was I create a website, Satoshi Alert, help us find Satoshi as a sort of viral marketing technique uh, without mentioning us. But if that gets a lot of traffic, in the end, we can always drop our own link there as well. But then sadly, someone uh, did that like six weeks ago. So I'm sitting on Satoshi. that domain for the past six months. And, uh, and someone made like find Satoshi or get Satoshi or something. That was John McAfee. Huh? That was John McAfee. Yeah, John McAfee with yeah. his new thing. Yeah, because yeah. he had a new app, right? Yeah, but yeah. it's all going bad. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I believe that. But the idea itself, like, idea was great, thing, yeah. because people are furious who is uh, Satoshi. And you get like, uh, I thought, I figured you're going to get free PR. You're just right. going to sneak that link to PR agencies, like, hey, I found a real site, check it out. And then hope, hopefully it will like buzz. They want to create traffic and then. Get yeah. It, yeah. So that was the idea about uh, I was too late, too late for little. But uh, don't be afraid to, to test things that are out of the box, because uh, those are the growth hacks that work the best. Because if companies did it 10 times already, uh, then the last time you're going to get less and less and less. 
to conversion. And that's also one thing, one mistake or a lesson we learned. Um, I read online that ebooks are great for conversions. Like if a free ebook, people drop the email. Uh, I thought, great, let's write an ebook. Uh, let's create a pop up free ebook, drop the email. We did a test, it worked great, like 28% more emails in very short time. So like, let's do this. So we ran it for about four weeks. Like, you do, if the first time you turn the site, you get the pop up free ebook. Uh, but then after a month, we saw less returning visits. It was already declining. And after two months, even even less uh, returning visits, even though the crypto market at that time was going up. So I thought, oh, the only thing we really changed was that pop up for the free ebook. So I think users find it annoying. Uh, and the email subscribers went down a little bit from the first yeah. release of it. So we removed it, and you saw it slowly saw the curve of the returning visits going back up again. So even though if something works, you still have to evaluate the data if it's still working. And if it isn't, remove it. But if it is, then double down on it. So if it was working very well, I would try to find more places to, to place a pop-up or be smarter with it or optimize the pop-up and stuff like that. But if it's if it's not working, don't be afraid to cut it, even though you spent money, time, and probably you're emotionally involved in that process. If it's not working, be straight to yourself. Be honest with yourself. Now, the last slide before we can go to the Q&A is uh, funnels. I heard you guys are looking to create funnels. <laughs> Now, funnels is a funny thing. It depends on what kind of funnel you want. Um, but yeah, eventually you want to get people in here and get them to a sale or, uh, or do a subscription in the end. Um, so the, so the, f the first thing is like, how do you get the users, right? Um, so one of the B2B funnels we're trying right now are LinkedIn bots. Um, so we have, uh, we have some fake accounts that are approaching people that ICO and CEO in the name, just called approaching them with a message like, hey, you're also in the blockchain space, uh, we have a large company, let's connect, maybe we can help each other. And then once they accept, we send them a, a soft call to action with a, with a linky to a, do our B2B page. And if they don't click on it, they get a harder sale at the end. And this is all automated. But we definitely see, um, it's like 50 clicks a week we're getting to the, to the sales page and we're just doing this for two weeks. And now if this works well, then obviously it's gonna be a lot more accounts coming up. Uh, gonna gonna contact on more keywords as well, um, but it's something that bots are not appreciated by everyone. But if you want a growth hack, uh, you have to get your hands dirty a little bit, uh, and that's the like a bit of the mindset you need to have. Like, um, if it's you're not breaking the law, uh, but you're breaking some maybe some personal ethical rules that you're not comfortable with, uh, don't do it if you're not comfortable with it. But don't be afraid sometimes to. You test the lines, like what are your limits that you're comfortable with. Um, another thing that we're trying to do now is we're creating funnels for B2C. And what we're doing is we're creating more websites uh, focused on airdrops, but it's just a landing page funneling people to our page. And on that one, we are going to try to do more, more and I, I would say black hat uh, methods, but gray hat. We like to call them gray hat. But there's some like uh, websites out there that they will send traffic to your website for dirt cheap, dirt, dirt cheap, uh, like one dollar for a thousand clicks. Um, and these are real people clicking to your site, but this is not really good for your website. So I, I tried to create it on a funnel, uh, and I call that funnel my shield as well, because it's not hurting my main brand, but I'm just sending the people to my, my landing page that's funneling to my main site. Um, and also, this will only work if this is your audience. But the audience here is these people are clicking on advertising for a penny. So these are people that are looking to make money online. So what are airdrops? It's it's a way to collect money online. So I'm not trying to to create this traffic boom with an audience that won't like my site or product in any way. I'm trying to find, or oh, this is a cheap way to get some traffic. I don't want to do it on my main site, but let's try it on a different site and funnel them there. And it's the right audience for my product anyway. Yeah, in the end here, in the bottom, there's a referral. If you can create a referral program, great. And this is the way that Dropbox protect themselves. It's a famous story. Uh, they were spending 
$350 on uh, customer acquisitions, even though their, their plan was like $9 a month, but it didn't really work. So they created a referral system uh, that was one of the first referral systems that went pretty viral. We had a referral system with the service we created, the adult service, like referral friends. We saw 35 people, 35% 35 of people came through a referral link. So that's a lot. Um, after we stopped hosting the service, we didn't really have a refill system anymore. And then you see, you get less backlinks and less external traffic coming in. And so now with the subscription model again, we're gonna get a refill system again. But you have to be, you have to figure out a smart referral system that people like to share. I know the popular referral system right now is that they, um, they incentivize people to refer friends every month. So, um, there's a bunch of referral systems right now that you get free access if you for a month if you refer X friends. And then after that month, your balance drops to zero again. You have to refer new friends. Um, so this is a pretty awesome system where every month people keep referring uh, friends. And um, so think in your business, like how can you create a referral system that's attractive for the users and not just copy paste a referral system from another company because it might not work for yours. Now. Is there any questions that I can help you guys with? <laughs> yeah, you go. What are your thoughts uh, at the moment uh, with the Facebook marketing, basically? So I'm not that experienced in Facebook marketing because Facebook blocks cryptocurrency advertising. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a bunch of other platforms that do that as well. I do have one colleague that's uh, making a lot of drop searching website. He is uh, experimenting, experimenting with it. He's getting good results. Uh, but for the Facebook uh, social media advertising, it's, it's not my cup of tea, actually. Uh, you mentioned a lot of SEO growth hacks. Mm -hmm. uh, Google penalizes you for those at a certain point, as yeah. far as I know. How are you protecting yourself against that? So I don't do black hat uh, methods on my main site. Uh, ah, okay. So when I do gray hat, black hat, uh, I try to do it on a funnel site. Uh, I definitely protect it. I saw some guy uh, said you need to hatch your SEO strategy. I thought that was smart, but I'm not doing that right now. But he said Google changed the algorithm a lot as well. So if you're very focused on ranking uh, precisely on the algorithm, once they change it, you start dropping and you have to do everything over again. Um, however, I don't know what the trench is where that makes sense. Because if you have, uh, we have, uh, I think we have 20,000 pages on our website now. Uh, so it would make sense to start hatching, I guess. Uh, but I think if you have like, under a thousand, it doesn't make sense to start hatching your SEO strategy. What we're working on right now with Adopler is we're trying to get Google snippets. Uh, where if you Google a certain keyword, you get the Google like points, so like boom, boom, boom. And we've been working on for six months on five keywords we get it now. Uh, they're not the best sought keywords, but uh, they're definitely there. And what I found out is that if a keyword is not competitive, it's easier to get it very quickly. Uh, I found some keywords not competitive at all. I write something and within a week I'm, I get the Google snippet. Uh, I have two, qu two uh, questions. Uh, it's kind of like my, I would say my field as well to some extent, so I, I love uh, uh, It's nice to talk about it. I'm wondering what, uh, what software you prefer to use for landing pages. Uh, do you have uh, any, anything specific like that? Um, what is the first question basically? All right, so we use Hotjar, like I mentioned, and most of the things okay, we, we use is a uh, custom build. Um, I don't know, we just started out like that. <laughs> like we start custom building things and we just kept going uh, on that. So, but we do definitely use Hotjar and it's very helpful to see how long people are spending in a certain area of the page. Uh, I know not a uh, good one for you, but all. Uh, Crazy action? No, no, it's a fun friend of mine. It's called Converti action. It's called Converti. All right. Yeah, you should check it out. Um, and the other question I have is, do uh, you use AREPS for your keyword research or what other tools do you use for Because I have some questions about that as well. Yeah, you know so, AREPS, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so we do use it. Um, yeah. So one of uh, our colleagues, I don't know, he has like a abonnement. Yeah. What's that? Like subscription, subscription. subscription. On, a, on a program or a platform that gives you all the subscription on all the SEO things. So I always get reports. Like every month, I get like five reports. One is uh, AA refs, one is uh, Spy SEO, mm -hmm. uh, something with Woo. WooCommerce? WooCommerce, I think. Nah. No. Yo, but yeah. Yo, yeah, Yoast is uh, on WordPress, yeah. But yeah, I, I just get like five different reports yeah. uh, because he has this one subscription, he gets them all. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And uh, you can, I think he got it uh, 
on some forum. Uh, <laughs> I can't mention which one now. Ask me later. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> no, that'd be strange. Yeah. Are, are you bullish on Ripple? No, I'm not. No? <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> so Ripple, is, uh, I don't know if you guys know much about cryptocurrency, but um, uh, in theory, for me, Ripple shouldn't have any value because it's a utility token. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's not even used on the Ripple uh, mainnet, uh, but they're very good in marketing, advertising, and since it's a top five coin, I believe that a lot of, I don't mean to, mean to bash new people into crypto, but a lot of the novice people into crypto, they think Ripple can go to 10K at one point as well, so they buy in uh, for the hype, basically. But um, from its characteristics of the coin, it shouldn't go up. It, it can go up if, if there's a lot of demand, obviously. The characteristics of the coin or token uh, doesn't seem good to have long-term inclusion value. Any other questions on the grow tech or? Just you mentioned competitors. Like, how, how do you balance between new customers? It seems that you're really focused on the customer acquisition part. Mm -hmm. How do you do on the retention? Uh, good one. So um, what I saw that every competitor of us did is um, they only list airdrops. Um, so I figured our platform is very good for beginners into crypto, and that's my long-term goal as well, that I get people that have zero crypto at all, don't know anything, they come to our platform. That's the end goal. So we start writing a lot of content uh, for beginners to how do, you, how do you make a Bitcoin wallet? How do you make a transaction? How do you secure your crypto? You know it doesn't have anything to do with airdrops on Seed. Um, it's something we like, to be, we like to educate the users. And then three months ago, we had an idea of... Um, we're going to do small updates. Uh, for example, the airdrop that you joined just had a distribution completed. You can find the smart contract here. And just small updates on small news events as well uh, to try to get the users to come back, even though if they're not claiming airdrops, that they, they, they define us as a source of information. And for that, we did an MVP as well, like a very ugly news feed, uh, just to see if people get clicks on it. And as soon as I got like 25,000 clicks, it's like, all right, let's improve the front end. Uh, and it's still going very well, like, like 50 clicks a month, some small news updates that we give them. Uh, and the front end is better now, it's still not what I want. And um, like the whole platform that we built is still not the end version that I had in mind. But I just try to do new things, MVPs, make it a little bit better. If I see like a lot of uh, clicks and users, then improve that again. But just go in phases where I don't want to build from zero to perfect within six months. I just Build. I read it. Try something else to keep them uh, around as well. Any question? Uh, how do you deal with the, <laughs> especially for the airdrop? How do you deal with the negative impact in the community? Like the crypto price going down? Oh, not on the crypto, but you have a lot of altcoins who had actual scam coins. Yeah, yeah. How do you deal with the community? Because I think in your case, community is very important. Yeah. So we do have a lot of content written on uh, how you spot the scams in the crypto. We always trying to warn people, especially like security ways. There's different ways to get scammed. Either they take your tokens or you join a project that ends up being scammed, but you didn't invest any money in it. Um, but other people might have. Hmm. So there's different levels of being scammed, but we try to warn them in every way. And then our team uh, does due diligence to make sure that we have curated content on the platform. And if we're not sure, we also give it a label, like uh, it's unverified because this and this and this, like we couldn't connect with the team. We, could, uh, we couldn't do this, we couldn't do that, and that's why it's unverified. So we try to mm -hmm. curate it, and if it's not curated enough, then we warn them on it as well. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the problem here is we've been struggling it for two years. Like, what's our responsibility? So in the beginning, we listed everything because we wanted uh, to be a neutral source of information. So you just grab everything. Every information you get, you put it in one place. And then we started seeing that more, uh, the problem of uh, scams in the ICO world was increasing. So we said, all right, we want to be a neutral form, but we also don't want people to get scammed. Or we don't want scam projects to be successful. So we started adapting a bit like, all right, we're going to curate them to a certain level. Um, like we're not uh, checking if all the code is what they say they are. But we just uh, like fact check. Is the, is the person of the team, are they really on the team? Uh, so we contact the person of the team. Is this company really here? So we, uh, maybe we call an address that is available to ask if the company is in the building. Uh, we, we fact check things that are public to see if they are true. So we do a lot of uh, manual custom validation. Yeah, yeah. so we, are, we have three people, like our team is three people strong, and the only, the only thing they do the is only, fact check. 
Yeah. And that's a yeah, that's a tough uh, it's a tough job. It's a tough job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyone in the back has a question? Uh, I was uh, I was uh, very curious to know about any growth hacks that you did and worked exactly opposite of what you're thinking that it might work. Um, something went bad sideways. Mm -hmm. so experiences if you have any. Um. Yeah, so I know on the Twitter, a lot of the social medias, um, they work uh, that if you, even though if you're big following, if you post something, only a small percentage of your own following sees it. And if you get engagement in the beginning, uh, it will show it to more of your own following. So I try to grow tag where there's companies, uh, they uh, instant like uh, stuff on your Twitter account uh, to boost that. And it was a short term success because uh, we saw a lot more engagement coming from our tweets uh, from our own community. But then uh, within four weeks, we got like frozen by Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Twitter is very tough to reach, by the way. If you, <laughs> if you ever have problems with Twitter, it's, uh, it's terrible. Uh, um, uh, so that, that kind of backfired. But then uh, like after a few days, like uh, harassing of Twitter and Twitter employees. So that's what I do. I just look up who are Twitter employees. I start connecting them on LinkedIn and <laughs> ask them to help me. <laughs> uh, but that was definitely one that backfired. Yeah. So I wouldn't recommend to use like bot traffic on Twitter. If you want to road hack the social media, um, I'm trying to create now is an ambassador program. Like I know the people that, uh, in my community that are very active. So I'm trying to create a group of 250 active users and then pay them either a fee for an upload or a like or a monthly fee. And then uh, every time we put a tweet, like alert the group saying, can you like and comment? Uh, I'm trying to create that uh, instead of bots because then it's, at least there's real people. Uh, and but the social media is always like what I, I really want like a, a person dedicated to the social media. Because every social media works different. Every algorithm works different. Uh, some social media are stricter than others, and we need to figure that out. And we're doing it a little bit like cowboys, you know. We try this, we try that. And uh, but if you have someone dedicated on it, doing the research as well, you, you'll get better results on it. That's quite a popular um, method on Instagram, especially like there's the bots. Well, not the bots, but actually having like um, um, similar pages in, in within a community working together to actually like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did and this also when I turned Yeah, it's like a trade. You like yours, they like, yeah. you like yours, and then it works for everything. Exactly. And I, I know um, usually they make a group in the Instagram as well. I know Instagram doesn't like these things very much. So I saw there's always some rumors in this group saying like, oh, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Things like that. But it is a trick. and. You should just keep trying tricks, tricks, tricks to see what works, uh, and then you you eventually you create your own trick bag, and then mm. and then you also start figuring out uh, what tricks are other companies using. Uh, once you start getting into that mindset of growth hacking, I always look at other companies. Hey, they're growing this, or how did they do this? And try to reverse engineer it. And with growth hacking, reverse engineering is not like reverse engineering code. You just look at their what have they been doing, what is the traffic they've been getting, how are they doing this. So it's a, if you get in the mindset, it's really fun. Is there any particular social media channel that uh, you feel is working better for your company than, than, than the others? Or? Um, so in the beginning, it was Telegram. Telegram was great in 2017 for us. We built a huge group in Telegram, and we saw lots of clicks every time we post something. But Telegram got a bit to do that. Uh, right now for crypto, there's a lot of uh, crypto companies. Uh, they found a growth hack. <laughs> so they diluted the whole uh, Telegram uh, space, basically. So what they did was, at least what I think they did, as so when I reverse engineered, um, I think they grabbed usernames and then put them in a group. Because I find I find myself in groups that I never joined. <laughs> and then they build channels of or hundred thousand, two hundred thousand people, and then start uh, direct trying to direct them to a site. Um, so I think they they grab it, put you in a group, and then send you somewhere else. But that really diluted the whole Telegram community. So now every time we post something on Telegram, it doesn't have the same. The fact. So right now, for us on social media, it's uh, Twitter uh, sends the most traffic, uh, but Twitter has a thing where people don't see it much in their feed. They really have to be constantly be posting on Twitter to make it work. Do you think uh, growth hacking in general for most startups is only a good idea in the, in the early stage to get sort of you know the ball rolling, or do you feel like in the later stage once you know you have regular traffic and users, you should still have someone in the team just focus on growth. 
I think you have to do it like nonstop. Okay. Like that's what we like. We're just full sprint every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's like three people in our team focused on quote only. Uh, and we just sprint, sprint, sprint every day. Try, try, try. Oh, this works. This doesn't. Oh, this works. Let's let's focus. Like see how we can make this bigger. Uh, and uh, I think I think uh, bigger companies uh, like Microsoft and stuff they also establishing growth teams right now. It, like the marketing team doesn't really do it well. They do one part well, driving the traffic, and then the retention, what you mentioned, is an issue, or they're not getting the conversions what they want. And so people are or companies are building growth teams for the long term. I think you should. It's fun too. Like it, once you start getting into it, it's fun because it's. Uh, I don't know. We're quite young, so we grew up online, so we like the instant gratification. I know I do. But if I uh, do a trick that works, I see it in my analytics immediately or in my sales. It's like a uh, gratification. Let's do this more and more and more, and then keep going. Um, you said um, you said when you're at MVP stage, you actually. Uh started to get recognized as a trusted brand. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us like when was that moment and then actually highlight how you maybe shifted your strategy in order to play off of that credibility you started to build? It kind of uh, went, I sh the switch was uh, forced for me. Um, so I, like I said, I was calling and uh, emailing all the ICOs, telling about us and how we can help them. Um, at some point, I couldn't keep up with all the inbounds. <laughs> I just kept emails, going on calls, and my day was scheduled full with calls. And uh, at some point, I wasn't preparing the calls. I just take them cold, like, all right, 2 p.m. Okay, and then start learning about the project on the call. So uh, so at some point, for me, there was a flipping point where I didn't have to outreach anymore. Everything was inbound. So then I knew, like, all right, I don't need to outreach anymore um, as well. And then did you do anything beyond the calls? Did you then change your growth hack strategies? You know, when you um, saw more uh, volume coming to the site. So one thing I did at that time, where um, where we, we did get all the inbounds, that was also a time where more uh, com uh, the first and more competitors started rising. Because uh, the first six months for us was the educational side, to edu educate the people and the project. So actually, when that flipped around, we started getting all the inbounds. So I changed the strategy there to. Um, so I did a PR release there at that time, where uh, what are airdrops and best places to find airdrops. Those were basically the two PRs I did. Um, one, I wanted to be linked to on all the water airdrops uh, articles. And two, I wanted people to think that we were the best. Uh, and from that, just two PRs on a few websites, uh, that snowballed in a lot of other PRs that basically copied the, the, the original two uh, articles that we had released. And it, we even had Bloomberg contact us inbound to start asking about the other and link to us in their article. And same with Wired and stuff. And that was only based because we did a small press release. So anything they were looking for adults, they would only find us. Mm -hmm. So then everyone put your put your link in their article as well. And so there was a point for us where organically it, I flipped my focus. Mm -hmm. Any other questions I can help you guys with? Super. Thanks so much, Morton. That was it. Great to have yeah. you. All right. Thanks, guys, Thank for listening. You.